This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. Okay, for those of you <clears throat> who weren't with us last week, we're going to put a, um, let me cue my uh, producer here, Ken, Ken we're going to put that uh, JPEG of the, lo of the Last Supper up on the screen right now. And I want you to take a look at this. You see here is Leonardo da Vinci's uh, view of the Last Supper. Okay. Lots of things wrong with that view, by the way. Uh, they didn't sit in chairs all on one side of the table. Uh, uh, comedians make fun of that. How come nobody sat on the other side of the table? Well, uh, New Testament accounts reveal, of course, that they reclined at table. They didn't use chairs to sit at tables in the first century. Uh, the, the table was a little uh, right down next to the ground, kind of like the Oriental uh, tradition uh, that exists today in the, some of those fancy Oriental Japanese food places. Anyhow, in that picture, it may have gone by too quick for you to even notice, there is a code, the Da Vinci Code book says, a code that uh, Leonardo da Vinci knew about. That code represents the female deity, the fact that uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married, the fact that Jesus had children by Mary Magdalene, all of that is seen in that picture, if you're just able to see it. And these concepts were kept from the church and through the centuries that information was suppressed and uh, last episode I actually showed you the proof text that came from the from the Gnostic Gospel of Philip that is used to to assert these concepts and today what we want to do very quickly is take a look at some of the other uh, doctrines that are taught by the Gospel of Philip that I want you to compare to the Bible People ask me regularly, why, how do we know that the books we have in the Bible are genuine and are inspired, and how do we know that those other books, like the Gnostic Gospel of Philip, is not inspired? Well, here's proof, real simple. Take a look at something the Gospel uh, of Philip says. Some neither desire to sin nor are able to sin. For those of you who are even slightly familiar with what the Bible teaches as a whole from Genesis to Revelation will recognize that that's a blatant doctrinal error. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, whose word are you going to take for it? Something that you know has a trusted history in interpretation something that you know where it came from, that contains evidence that it was inspired by God, the Bible, the book of Romans, or will you accept the Gnostic Gospel of Philip, um, the history of which is shrouded in mystery? We don't even know who translated it. We don't know where it came from. Our best guess is it came from about the third century. Let me give you another verse that conflicts directly with what the Gospel of Philip says, found in 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. You see, for anyone to claim, anyone at any time in history to claim that there, some people just don't sin, don't need to, can't do, you know, is, is a lie. Uh, the fact is, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what the Bible says. Well, here's another teaching from the book of Philip. Uh, I'm quoting from it again. Adam came into being from two virgins, from the Spirit and from the virgin of the earth. Well, th that's a real interesting co uh, secret knowledge that Philip contains. Here's what the Bible has to say, Genesis 2 and verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust, from the ground, 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Uh, there's what the Bible has to say about man's creation. Here's another false concept taught in the Gospel of Philip. There are two trees growing in paradise. One bears animals, the other bears men. Adam ate from the tree which bore animals. He became an animal and he brought forth animals. For this reason, the children of Adam worship animals. Now, uh, this is so consistent with the kind of ghibli goop that you get from Gnostic Gospels and Apocryphal books. Uh, there are gross errors in science and nature and biology in these kind of accounts. And to compare that with what the Scriptures teach, look at what Genesis 2 and verse 8 says. Then the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and He placed the man whom He had formed out of the ground. The Lord, Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing in the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There it is. That's what the Bible has to say about what was in the garden as you compare it to the Gospel of Philip, the Gnostic Gospel of Philip. Here's another gross, grievous error. The Gospel of Philip says this, I quote, The world came about through a mistake, for he who created it wanted to create it imperishable and immortal. He fell short of attaining his desire, end of quote. Now, folks, if, if I really believed any of that, uh, I wouldn't waste my time with religious things. I wouldn't waste my time studying about God or trying to obey God or worshiping God. If, if, if God is, is capable of failing at anything that He attempts to do, then He's not the God of the universe. He's not a God that I'm concerned about. If God can't do what He wants to do, He's not God. And the Bible makes that so clear. Jeremiah 32, verse 17 says this, Ah, Lord God, behold, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Now, you see how the Bible talks about God, the creator of the universe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do that? John, the first chapter of John says he, he spoke it into existence. It wasn't too hard for God. You see, the Gnostics had this ridiculous humanistic concept of God. The Bible presents God as omniscient, omnipotent. He, he doesn't fail at what he attempts to do. Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2 says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. God knows. God has knowledge. Not the Gnostics who claim to have knowledge. You, you see, th th this is a, a principle of human nature that existed beginning in the first century and does quite clearly today that people are fascinated with secret knowledge, something that everybody doesn't know. That's what people want to know. I want to know the secrets. And if those secrets have been hidden, and you can only get them if you come to me, and by the way, my book is 1995. You buy my book and you'll know all the secrets. Then you will have the knowledge that nobody else has. This is how it plays out in our world today. But it's no different from that secret knowledge that the Gnostics claim to present. You didn't know that God doesn't know it all, did you? You didn't know that He couldn't do what He wanted to do. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 4. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him in love. And another one, 1 Peter 1, and verse 20. For He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times 
for the sake of you. Peter's talking about Jesus. Jesus, God knew before the world was made exactly what it was he was going to do and accomplish, how he was going to make it, that Jesus would come and redeem man. These concepts, biblical concepts, completely contradict then the notions that the Gospel of Philip present, that God created the world by mistake, that he didn't know what was going to happen. When we come back in just a minute, I'll, I'll give you one quick glimpse into the Gnostic Gospel of Mary, and we'll talk about how it relates to the Da Vinci Code. We'll be right back. Let me go back to the Gospel of Mary. The Gospel of Mary, and we're going to put this one up on your screen right here, says this. Peter, you are always irate. Now I see that you are contending against the woman like the adversaries. But if the Savior made her worthy, who are you to reject her? Surely the Savior knew her very well. For this reason he loved her more than us. Getting back to this main underlying concept that is so popular in the New Age movement view of the Bible and in our culture and is found in the Da Vinci Code that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the proof text. This is where you're exposed to the sacred feminine the marriage of Jesus, the gospel of Mary, a Gnostic gospel, came to us from the 3rd century A.D. It was written on papyrus in Coptic. The first six pages of the gospel of Mary, Mary are lost. We don't have any idea what they, what they said. There's no history of its transmission through the centuries. We don't know who translated it from Coptic into English. These Gnostic gospel accounts are a collection of documents that were written by an early group of false teachers known as Gnostics. Gnostic is the Greek word for knowledge. In fact, the specific Greek word is epigenosis, which means literally a higher knowledge. And the Gnostics were not in the, in the least bit concerned with giving us a narrative of Jesus' life like the Gospels that you have in your Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Gnostics claimed this higher knowledge, knowledge that you couldn't, you couldn't have through any other source. And the, 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 the knowledge that the Gospels written by the Gnostics sought to present was always esoteric is the word that the scholars use, secret writings. You had to know these secret writings to know properly anything about God. And if you had this knowledge, then you, you knew something that others didn't know. And in the Gnostic accounts, you often have what is referred to as cosmological dualism. That's the big fancy scholarly word that they used, it was an essential feature of Gnosticism. It, it, it says, uh, in, in the, the fancy language says, basically, matter is evil, spirit is good, and only Sophia, the Greek word for wisdom, is good. By the way, Sophia happens to be one of the characters in Brown's book, and so there's all these intricate codes weaving in and out that only if you have knowledge would you be able to identify those. Most Gnostics held that Christ never actually lived in a physical body, never actually lived in the flesh. He, it just looked like he did. That was the Gnostic idea. Therefore, what our Bible tells us about Christ's life physically, it's, it's not accurate. And, and he didn't really die on the cross. He didn't really die a physical death. Mel Gibson has it all wrong with the Passion of Christ. None, none of that really happened. It just looked like it did. The Gnostics, you see, have this higher knowledge. You poor, unwashed masses don't have this knowledge available to you. Salvation is found in knowledge, not in faith. Some Gnostics, therefore, 
completely deny the physical realities of life. Most Gnostics took a very aesthetic view towards sex and marriage, discerning um, that it was in, inappropriate to become involved in physical relationships. That's one of the reasons why it's laughable to see the way that Dan Brown's book uses this, the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Mary to try to present a physical relationship between Jesus and Mary because the, the Gnostics uh, abhorred that concept. Physical relationships were demeaning. They weren't significant at all in the Gnostic thought. Uh, those who were really spiritually minded didn't get involved in those kind of things. The Gnostics also presented a, a concept that there, there would come a time when all females would be transformed into males. In fact, they thought that in Eden, prior to the, to the uh, formation of woman in the Gnostic gospel, it was a man who was transformed into a woman. In <laughs> so you have the, the first sex change operation occurring in the Garden of Eden in Gnostic thought. Well, let me give you a couple of Bible passages to hang your hat on that, uh, that show the fallacy of such concepts. 2 John, John beginning in verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. You see, by the middle of the second century and into the third century, uh, this concept of Gnosticism that had its beginning, I believe, in the, in the first century was coming into fruition. Those who said that he didn't come in the flesh were the Gnostics. That's what he's talking about here. And John spares uh, uh, nothing when he calls them the Antichrist. And that's, that's literally what the way that the Antichrist is used throughout the New Testament. Not to refer, refer to some future coming of some horrific monster, but anyone who would teach against that which has been revealed about Christ. Remember what he says in verse 9 here. Any, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. We have uh, the testimony of the early church fathers, Hippophilus, Tertullian, others who by the middle of the second century were criticizing strongly the Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic Gospels were never considered, never considered part of the New Testament. They are not the earliest accounts. Most scholars, as I've mentioned, believe that they come to us from the third century, uh, but all Bible scholars that I know of, without exception, believe that the Gospel accounts in our Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, come to us from, from the first century. So they existed long before the Gnostic Gospels came into existence. Let me give you a quote from the Da Vinci Code, which says, quote, Constantine attempted to eradicate the earlier Gospels, the Gnostic Gospels, but some survived. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the 1950s hidden in a cave near Qumran in the Judean desert. And of course, the Coptic scrolls in 1949, uh, 1945 at Nag Hammani. That's page 234 of the Da Vinci Code. He also says on page 234, the scrolls highlight glaring historical discrepancies and fabrications, clearly confirming that the modern Bible was completely was compiled and edited by men who possessed a political agenda to promote the divinity of the man Jesus Christ. 
Well, that's what the Da Vinci Code says. It's patently untrue. That's air. It's false. Now, I, it's a novel. Remember, it's a novel. And if you can read it as a novel and say it's all a bunch of hooey, then bless you. <laughs> uh, but when someone starts at the very beginning and says this is a fact and then represents documents as carelessly as Brown does and has his character saying things that I hear people say who have objections toward the inspiration of the Scriptures, then I, I'm going to challenge that. Uh, it really makes me laugh, these last statements. The Nag Hammani texts that were found at Nag Hammani, Egypt, were, were written in Coptic. They come to us from the 3rd century. The Dead Sea Scrolls, it's really funny how he uses those because the Dead Sea Scrolls have nothing to do with New Testament Christianity. The Dead Sea Scrolls were written 100 years B.C. We know that they were put in the caves at, at the Dead Sea 100 years B.C., folks, and were not discovered until, I'll correct him on this, 1948. It wasn't in the 50s. It was 1948. A little shepherd boy threw a rock into a cave or heard, heard a jar break, and there they were. Thousands of Old Testament manuscripts as, long as, as well as manuscripts from the Essene community. They took a copy of Isaiah's scroll that they found in 1948, and they compared it to the oldest scroll that we'd found up to that point, which came to us from 1000 A.D. Now, here's, here's the comparison you need to make. We know that scroll was put in that cave 100 years B.C. We also know this other scroll came to us from 1000 A.D. A thousand years difference, give or take, in between. You know what? There was virtually no difference whatsoever between Isaiah's scroll found in the Dead Sea and the oldest known manuscript coming to us from 1000 A.D. What does that prove? It proves that the Bible was accurate throughout those centuries, that the same Bible that we had in the first century is the same Bible that we have today. It's laughable that Brown would try to bring in the Dead Sea Scrolls as evidence of biblical errors. Well, I'm out of time, but I will continue this discussion next week on what do the Scriptures say. Trust your Bible. It's God's Word. We thank you for your interest in what do the Scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to ScripturesSay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.